this Timothy chapter 5. We're, um, we're going through section by section, um, and we begin in verse 3 tonight, this longer section uh, devoted to the uh, diaconal care of, of widows. First uh, Timothy chapter 5, verse 3. We're going to read the section, um, though uh, we'll have several sermons uh, in this particular section. So beginning tonight then reading from verse 3 and just before we read God's word I'll pray. God help us tonight. We thank you that you set aside this day for your worship and for our good. We know that when we come before you and humbly ask of you to be fed and be directed by Christ and his spirit, you graciously come to us, Lord, and you do teach and you do lead us. Lord, we uh, can find ourselves easily distracted at the best of times and certainly on a Sunday evening. But We pray that you would give us attentive minds and hearts and that we would hear some, some truth tonight. Lord, work through our own folly to show to us, O oh Lord, the wisdom of God. And we pray that we would receive what you say here with gladness and that our walk would be improved because of it. Hear us, O oh God, in your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable before God. Now she, who is really a widow and left alone, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works. If she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. But refuse the younger widows, for when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, having condemnation because they have cast off their first faith. And besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies, saying things which they ought not. Therefore, I desire that the younger widows marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some have already turned aside after Satan. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. Amen. So here we uh, begin this uh, quite large section on the care of widows, and there are several uh, different strands to the section, um, qualifications as to who is to be considered a, a genuine widow, uh, and who should be cared for in some other way. Um, but the thing that I want to focus on uh, tonight, our first sermon in this body, is, is the referral of the care of widows back to the family. And funny enough, the, the real focus of the sermon is not, is not actually going to be on the church's care of widows or even the family's care of widows, um, but the family's care for itself on, on your responsibility under God to care for your own. And the message is this, that a heart for God begins in the home. A heart for God begins in the home. The first point 
uh, I want to make is this, that the heartbeat of the passage is God's care for the vulnerable. God has always had a heart for the most needy, for the defenseless, uh, for those who are in need of a protector. In God's covenant community of old in Israel, he wrote love into his law. Uh, The second table of the law is all about how we are to love our neighbor. Uh, This is what God required of his people, that to those that they lived amongst, even to the stranger, they would demonstrate love and the particular extension of love, that they would be merciful to those who were in need of mercy. That familiar verse often quoted by Christ in the Gospels, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And if you see the parallelism in the verse, what he's saying is that those who know God, who have a relationship with God, are those who would be merciful, merciful to their neighbors. Now, God is especially concerned in Israel for the most vulnerable. And uh, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 10, but I read again, uh, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. Why? For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. You see the groups that are um, especially set apart in God's word are those who ordinarily have nobody else to care for them. Uh, Without a man to provide for the household in the ancient Near East, and at this time you were as good as dead. And so if you're a child without a father, you need a father. If you are a wife without a husband, you need a husband. If you are a stranger who has come into what is to you a foreign land and you don't have the network of family, you need somebody who will be as family to you. And what God asks of his people is that they would do just that, just as he has a heart for the most vulnerable, they would have a heart for the most vulnerable amongst them. These people that he sets aside are a people who would have nobody in this world if they did not have God. But the most remarkable thing is that God is even in general to all people a benevolent God and he fights the corner of those who are most in need. He has a heart of compassion for those that are rejected and downtrodden and exposed to the harshness of a sinful world. God has written love and mercy into his law. And in the church, the covenant community of God, the new covenant community of God, uh, it's to be no different. Pure and undefiled religion is what? To visit orphans, and widows, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. God has a deep concern for the most vulnerable, and it's for this reason that here in a relatively short letter, you have a large section, all the way from verse 3 down to verse 16, that is dealing with the care of widows. God is really, really concerned that within the church, those who need help would receive help. Now, if you uh, know the section and if you were uh, paying attention as we were reading through the section, you know that there are all kinds of qualifications. Um, Those who are old enough to qualify have to have uh, lived a certain life, be living a life of faith. Those who are younger are encouraged to to marry um, and to provide for themselves. Um, And those who have family are referred back to the family. The family is to care for them. And you could kind of get the impression, almost, that caring for the widows in the church is almost like a last resort. Uh, Like God is saying, yes, let's care for them, but uh, only if they meet this, that, and another 
requirement as though God were miserly towards them, but in fact, it's the exact opposite. And you see that in verse 16. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened. Why? That it may relieve those who are really widows. If there is a sifting process here in the diaconal work of the church, the reason there is a sifting process is that the most vulnerable would receive exactly the kind of help they need from the church. God cares too much for maladministration, for sin or neglect to get in the way of mercy within his church. The thing that drives this passage is God's own care for the vulnerable. It's the first point. Second, Note that God's care begins in the home. So three times, these are our verses tonight in verse, three, uh, verse 4, verse 8, and verse 16. We're told that the first responsibility to care for the widow, to care for the needy, lies with the family. But the point I want to make here is this, that it's not that the family is an alternative to God's care through his church, as though God cared in his church, but then there is this lesser body of the family, and really they should take care of things before the church has to dirty its hands. Rather, both the church and the family are held out as the two arms of God. Both of them are God's vehicles for mercy. Both are ordained for the care and for the protection of the most vulnerable. In verse 4, we read, If any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents, for this is good and acceptable before God. So if there is a widow, she has children or grandchildren, there is a responsibility on their part to provide for the parents or to provide for their grandparents. But why? Not only because it relieves the burden of the church, as we said in verse 16, that the church might really care for those who are widows. Not only because there is a societal and culturally appropriate um, dynamic to this, but because it is pleasing to God. Because this is good and acceptable to God, just as, note in chapter 2 and verse 3, public prayer that all men might be saved is good and acceptable to God. This is God's will, that the family ought to care for the widows amongst them. It's an extension of the fifth commandment. You should honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the earth. Remember that Paul quotes again that commandment for us at the end of the book of Ephesians. There is blessing for those who honor their parents, who honor their grandparents. It is pleasing to God. He says in this, in verse 4, it is an expression of piety and of godliness to care for your parents, to care for the widow, to care for the widow grandparent is an expression of godliness. It is an expression of your faith before God. Now, if it is godly to care for the widow, if this is piety within the home, then it, what it's doing is it's making clear to us that this is a requirement that God has made clear to his people. He has ordained this as a duty of his people. And my point is this, that that care that happens in the home then is not an, an alternative or secondary to God caring through his church, but rather that God himself has ordained the family to care for the most vulnerable. You see this even outside of the church. He has written into nature by his common grace the family. It is natural for us to grow up within family and to see extended families in other cultures. And because of the family that he has written into human nature, those who receive need, who, who need, uh, sorry, care, who are to receive love, who are to receive mercy, would receive it by nature from their own family. God as an extension of his heart to mankind, has ordained both the church, but also the family. His tender love begins through the family, 
before it begins in the church. He's not fobbing off those genuine widows when he says, your families better take care of you. He's saying, I have ordained also this, the family. The family is my compassion, my love, my social security for those who need it most. And so the heartbeat of the passage is God's care for the vulnerable. God's care begins in the home before the church. Now thirdly, therefore a heart for God also begins in the home. If God has ordained the family as the first sphere of his love, then the family is the first test of your love for him. Why is it in 1 Timothy 3 we're told that the great test of a man suitable for the eldership or for the diaconate is a man who cares for his home? Because here is where you see whether a man truly has a heart for God or not, whether he is able to love and to care for those who have been put directly in front of him. We already considered that. But here we're told to the whole church, here is the measure of your love for God. Verse 8, he says, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith, and he is worse than an unbeliever. These are incredibly harsh words, some of the harshest words that Paul has spoken. If we cannot provide for our own, especially that of our own household, we are denying the faith and we are worse than an unbeliever. How can he say this? Because as we know, we are judged according to knowledge. We are judged according to the grace that we have received. As I've already said, God has written into nature, and you see it outside of the church, a a natural propensity towards family. He's made man in his own image. He has given them conscience. He's given them reason. And when you look outside of the church, you'll see that, relatively speaking, unbelievers, the godless, do quite a good job of caring for their own. Uh, I spent some time in Albania, and there they practice um, an extended household. The oldest son uh, naturally assumes responsibility for the care of his parents. When uh, When he marries and he gets older, it is his duty, if his parents get old, that they are to move into his home. Uh, that he would be there, that his wife would meet their needs, kind of like a 24-hour carer, and that they would be on hand to help with the grandchildren, and he would go out and he would work. And so the family come together, and in those countries where you don't have very generous social welfare, this becomes a lifesaver. You'll see even in our own country, unbelievers do a tremendous job of caring for the family. It's amazing, blood binds people together and gives them a security that they don't know in the world outside of the family. But we don't just have this by reason and by nature. We as God's people have been shown a higher order of love. Chapter 1 and verse 15, the first faithful saying, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance. The Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We know the love of God in a way that those outside of the church do not know the love of God. We know of God's commitment to us as defenseless sinners without any plea before God for mercy without any plea before God for leniency but we know how he came his son into the world clothed himself with flesh exposed himself to the harsh elements of a cursed world in order to save us the chief of sinners 
We know how Christ has spoken to our conscience, pointed out our sin, and comforted us with the the redeeming qualities of his blood and of his cross. We know of how he has brought us into the spiritual family of his church, where we are cared for not only in our souls, but our bodies are cared for also, where we are encouraged and we are helped along by one another. We have known a higher order of love through the gospel that has come to us. And here's Paul's point, that if we profess this love, we will practice an approximation of it. If we have known the love of Christ, we will approximate that love in our love to our own family. But here's the big difference. If Jesus Christ did that for you whilst you were his enemies, what does it say of your understanding of the love of God if you cannot love your own family? He loved you while you were his enemy. How much easier it ought to be for us to live, to love the members of our extended and of our immediate family. Now there are a couple of things to note here. The duty to care for widows is broadened in this verse. We already said that the duty to care for widows flows out from the fifth commandment, the duty to care for parents and grandparents. But note that here in verse 8, it flows out of a general duty that we all have to care for the broader family. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and he is worse than an unbeliever. And so Paul begins with a broader um, group of people. If a man does not provide for his own, he doesn't specifically define how broad that group is. He leaves it to every man to decide in his conscience how broad that group is. And then he narrows it and he says, especially those of his own household, therefore encompassing parents and grandparents and children and grandchildren. And so he broadens the duty beyond widows. It's something that comes out of a responsibility we all have to care for our own, especially for those of our own household. Now, also, the particular application here is about material aid to widows being uh, brought into either the care of the family or the care of the church that their material needs would be met. But if the motivating factor, if the example shown to us is the love of Christ, then the care that Christ has placed upon us to exercise to our own, own family clearly goes beyond material provision. We are to care for our own families in the way that Christ himself has cared for the church. Once again, this is why when it talks of elders and their love for their family, uh, the reason that that is the great test is because the way they care for the family is a reflection of how they will care for the church. They are to care for them with teaching and with patience and with love and with generosity and with correction with all of these things the love of Christ compels us to pursue a holistic full love first within the sphere of family before we even begin to think about our corporate responsibility here's what Paul is saying that a heart for God love for Christ begins first in the home before it's exercised in the church. Let your love for Christ be exercised in your love for your family. Now, the particular application in the text is to widows, widowers by extension, and parents. Wherever we have these within our household, consider yourself blessed to have the privilege to be the extension of God's arm of mercy towards them. Be ready, plan, and prepare to meet their needs, whatever their needs may be. Material needs, social needs, spiritual needs. There's no rule book on this. Every situation is uh, complex and unique. But as much as depends on you, you are given this duty by God to care for your family, 
in the fullest possible sense. And I tentatively suggest as a passing note that whilst part of that may be care that we refer to others and when we have elderly parents, sometimes we put them in, in care homes or in nursing homes and, and that's fine, but uh, their, needs, um, their needs go beyond what they receive there. They need community. And you may say, oh, well, they receive community in the care home, in the nursing home, there's other people there. But they need more than that. They need to be reminded of the love of their family. This is why we, we visit our relatives, we visit our elderly relatives. But more than that, they need Christ. If they're Christians, they need to be encouraged in Christ. And if they're not Christians, they need to be reminded of Christ. And we need to appeal to them of Christ. And so where you have widows, widowers, family, uh, parents, grandparents, uh, commit yourself to providing for them this fullest, uh, most comprehensive love, just as Christ has loved you. Uh, but then also, uh, and the broader aspect which I talked about, our own family, uh, we have family all around us, extended family, more local family, but all of it lies within the sphere of our responsibility to varying degrees. If anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Here's what we're to do. Think about your own family as a little parish and you as a little priest. And this is what God has done. He has placed you there as a little priest to minister amongst that parish that you know of. And to minister to the varying needs of the parish of your family. There's a responsibility, yes, to provide for them. If any are, are lacking anything that they need in, in, in clothing, in, in housing, in, in material benefits, then meet it if you're able to do so. But they need more than this. They need instruction, they need teaching, they need encouragement, they need challenging. And one of the things that you'll notice, it's very easy for Christians who have family members that are difficult to uh, almost run as a kind of escapism into the life of the church. But Paul says this will not do. There is nothing noble about committing to the church and neglecting your own family. You'll have heard it said many times of ministers, great men of God, who were tremendous in giving their lives to the service of the church, but they did neglect their own family because they were so busy in the work of the Lord. No, there is nothing noble in a man who gives himself to the life of the church, but neglects his own family. When I was married and when you were married, you probably heard uh, well-intentioned but disgruntled words of single people in the church who are frustrated because they say, you married people, it's terrible. Once you get married, all of your time is, is absorbed by the family and you just don't give enough to the church. And there's, there's truth in that. There has to be a balance, but at the same time, note this. When you marry, your responsibility has increased and you have a duty before God to love that family as Christ himself loves his church. Every one of you, in the extension of your family, even in the unbelievers, they are your parish you are the little priest. And just as God, as Christ, has loved his church, you are to go as much as depends upon you and to love them materially and spiritually. And so let me ask you tonight, how well are you serving the parish of your own family? Christ doesn't neglect any of his own. Of those the Father gave him, he's, he lost none, he said. Christ doesn't even neglect those in the world outside. He is forever going to them and pleading with them through nature, pleading with them through Christian messengers. Are you doing the same for your family for the wider family, for cousins, for uncles, for aunties, for sisters, for brothers. God has placed you there as an arm of his mercy, of his tender love to them.
And so ask yourself and regularly ask yourself the question, am I honoring Christ in the love that I give to my family? Paul begins here referring the care of widows first to the home, not as second best, but because God has ordained the family as the vehicle of his care, especially for the most vulnerable. Amen.